rest in your freedom. Awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name's lifted high, oh God, you have done great. Hello, hello. You can have a seat. My name is Kaipo Thomas, one of the pastors here. Great honor and privilege to be with you tonight. How are we doing? Good. All right. Friday nighters. Good to be in the house. A little misty, a little rainy, you know. It's good, though. You know, you guys all could probably fit right here. Just scoot in. If you're a little cold, you know, just, you know. We can. Anyway, we've got space. You guys can spread out. You can spread out. Uh, yeah, my name is Kaipo Thomas. Great honor and privilege to be with you tonight. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. Uh, I would say that there's a lot you can do on a Friday night up country. But there's really not a lot you can do on Friday Night of Country. So I'm glad you're here, though. I'm glad you're here. Uh, on the way in, you got a bulletin. There's more details in the bulletin than what I'm going to cover right now. But a couple of things. One, that bulletin, yeah, uh, information, more detail in the seat pocket in front of you. I kind of sound like, uh, was a flight attendant people in the seat pocket in front of you? Anyway, the seat pocket in front of you, there's two things I want to highlight. One is our Connect card. First time guests, you can fill that connect card out, take it to the coffee cart, and we have a free specialty uh, drink for you tonight, free on us. You guys like that? Come to church, and we give you stuff. Not just the gospel, and not just love, but we'll give you free specialty gifts. If, if you attended, if, if tonight's your first night, or if last week Easter was your first time attending, or how about this one? If you've just started attending Waipuna in the last month, you can get a free specialty gift. Okay. So, right, woo, wow, wow, right? I, I would say just if you've never gotten your specialty, but who knows, right? Anyway, we're, we're generous, we're generous. So, uh, first time guests, take that Connect card, even in the first time, you know, in the, in the last month, go to the, the Connect uh, uh, offering envelopes. We don't necessarily designate a time in the service to take an offering. Um, Cole will pray for the offering, amongst other things, at the end of the praise and worship set. But use the Connect card, right, and Use that as an opportunity to, to worship tonight, right? We worship through song. We'll worship through prayer. We'll worship through tithe and offering. Um, 
and, and use it at your own discretion, right? Sometime during the service, if you want to drop it, we have a few um, offering boxes on the way out. You know, use that as an opportunity for you to worship. A first-time guest, don't feel obligated to have to give at all, right? We, we'd like to encourage you who are just the trending, right? Just come and stay. Don't give at all, right? Especially if organized religion and money, right? If they're in, in your past, if there's been organizations that haven't managed that money well, our encouragement to you is stay here as long as you can, right, until we can build that trust with you, right? Look at all our numbers. See all the numbers that come in. Where does the numbers go, right? Who, uh, what organizations we give to. Um, I, I think you'll see that there's overwhelming evidence that we, ha we really try to be good, faithful stewards of what comes in every single week. I mean, down, down to the penny. But we, we love to save. We love to give. We, we love to use everything that comes in on the weekend for, for God's kingdom and his glory, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're here, to preach the name of Jesus, to use all of our time, resources, and energy to, you know, preach the name of Jesus and love people in the name of Jesus. So hopefully tonight you get, um, you know, you receive a little bit of God's love, right, a lot of God's care um, in that time. So anyway, that's uh, free, free to you, especially gift, offering, if, if you choose so. Uh, let me just highlight a couple announcements. We love kids at Waipuna. Anybody love the young ones around here? Three things. We got a children's clothing exchange tomorrow. You come and bring clothes you don't want, and you get to take clothes that you do want. Awesome, right? We have two other announcements for kids. One, we got um, some summer camps coming up. So let's start with the young ones. This camp is the, the later, so June 17th through the 20th. You might be thinking, why are we announcing this camp so early? Well, the sports and the art part, right, the specific art part, that gets filled really quick. Because of supplies and space, the art part gets filled real fast. There's limited space. So if you have young ones, right, that are in that elementary age, you would want to sign up, especially if you want them involved in the art section. Um, so the art gets filled fast, the sports one, we have a lot more space. And also, if you guys want to uh, volunteer, right, if you're thinking about uh, volunteering and you don't have the time to be on a regular schedule every month serving, but you're like, I could serve, you know, during the summer, I got more time, and maybe once a year serve, man, Sports and Arts Camp, a great opportunity. So that's the June 17th through the 20th. You can register your kids and yourself if you want to volunteer online. Um, but the camp that's before that, one that I is true to my heart, you know, is the middle schoolers and high schoolers, right? So we partner with Unashamed Hawaii. So Unashamed Hawaii is uh, uh, an uh, organization of churches on Maui who love young people and have loved young people since 2003. And we... Um, chase after middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so that camp is May 31st to June 4th. That registration is open at um, unashamedhawaii.com. And uh, I'm ecstatic. It's going to be a combined camp. So normally we have middle schoolers and high schoolers separate. But because of the camp availability and things, we, we're having them all at one camp. Pray for us, please. I just went to Costco yesterday because the, the camp that we use um, – used to be the old YMCA camp in KNI. It's no longer owned by YMCA. It's now KNI Uka, which is awesome because it's guys from KNI who are managing the KNI camp for the KNI people, right? So it's just like, so, so we've actually talked to them and we are in partnership with them, right? And they're, um, they're giving us like, I haven't ever paid this cheap of a cost to use that facility. So we're trying to do capital improvement projects so that they can give the camp to us. So anyway, just anyway, I went to Costco to get more tents. I bought uh, five of those carport tents, and I bought 50 cots, right? Because there's about a, there's a, I, I needed about 50 more beds. And I was like, Costco had all the cots. It was summertime. I was like, I was going to buy this right now. Mine, let's go, right? Anyway, thank you for you guys offering. I can buy cots for my kids to go to camp, right? Anyway, um, so anyway, we love kids. Clothing exchange, two great camps for you to be a part of. Uh, something else we also love is uh, first-time attenders, right? If you just started coming in, in the last month and you don't know all the deep, dark secrets of Waipuna, right? The secret handshakes. We want to teach them to you. All right? So welcome to Waipuna, May 5th and May 15th, right? It's uh, on the Sunday. Uh, it's a time for us to teach you right, our, our, our history, 
the staff, how we make decisions here, what our beliefs are here. It's, it's two weekends in a row. If you come on the 5th, we'll even feed you lunch because it's Aloha Sunday. Just throwing that out there. Um, we'll feed you lunch, and you can come and learn. But the sign-up is online, um, and, and so check that out, right? Also, uh, for, for the first-time guests, um, we have Welcome to Ipuna, and then what was our other two? Wait, wait. Wait, I have notes. What was the other slide? Uh, oh, that's it. Oh, um, no, no, no. The other one is if uh, on Sunday, and, and maybe some of you in here brought a friend who came on Sunday, but um, Pastor Sean gave an opportunity for people to, to make a decision for the Lord. We actually have new believer packets, Bibles, journals, a, a small little devotional book. So, so if you were here on Sunday and raised your hand, right, and you're like, man, I, I could use more resources. We have a gift for you. Or if you brought a friend with you, right, that, that is kind of young, they're just starting off, and, and they don't have material, we have it in stock, right? So see the connect table on your way out. Take one of those little packets. Take a Bible. Take some other um, resources for them, right? So we, we want to be um, generous here. We want to provide that opportunity for you. So um, that's, I just want to let you know about that resource. Um, okay, so flow service. Cole and the team are going to come back up here, and they'll, they'll lead in uh, praise and worship, right? And uh, the tomb is still empty, right? The cross is still empty, right? Hopefully our heart's a little full. My encouragement is whatever you brought with you that's supposed to be for the Lord, give it to the Lord. Amen? Shouts of praise. Let's shout our praises out, right? If there's a prayer request under your heart, let's, let's pray that out, right? Cole will definitely lead in prayer, but I encourage you in that time. If you got things on your heart to pray, pray that out. God will work it all out, right? He can hear all of us simultaneously. Um, so he'll lead in praise and worship and then pray. And then I have a dear friend, or, or Waipuna has a dear friend in the house, Kyle Powers. Uh, he's a um, devoted follower of Jesus. He's a husband. He's a father of three. He is one of our local mission partners who leads a, a fellowship of Christian athletes um, up country. And his goal is to get to every school on Maui. Um, but he's doing a great work, and he gets to bring the word tonight. Great communicator. Um, been in ministry for a long time. Moved. Sorry, I don't to preach a sermon. Anyway, you know. You know, moved to Maui during COVID. Um, adopted three kids, and, you know, he, he found... God's calling here. So anyway, he gets to bring God's word tonight. John chapter 3. It's the first in our new series, Come and See. Um, still in John. And so anyway, that'll be good. After, you guys ready? There's more. Okay? Praise and worship. You get a free concert tonight. You get a free message. Right afterwards, we're going to break bread together. We're going to have communion. Communion is open to anyone who would receive the invitation, right, to have a relationship with Jesus. Okay? After communion meal, we actually will have another meal, right? So it's the first Friday of every month, and church gets better and better. Okay, I'm glad you guys came today. We'll have free pizza outside and another concert after. So every first weekend, this is just too much, right? Every first weekend, we have Aloha Sunday, but we felt like the Friday nighters were kind of abandoned. So we said, let's add some food. And they said, man. Right? There's no second Friday service. Why not we just extend in worship? So right after the closing prayer, we'll dismiss. And the team, kind of a new team, they're going to come up here. And they're just going to play four or five songs. If you guys want to hang out and linger and pray and worship, do it. If you want to get some pizza first and you do it, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> okay? If you want to grab your kids, have them come up, eat some pizza, right? And praise and worship, by all means. Let's do it. We good, church? Let's stand, let me pray, and we will get moving. We will get moving. I'm excited. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, man. That opening song, yeah, he has done great things. I, I, let's do something. Bring to mind a great thing that God has done. Bring to mind, bring to heart. Jesus, we praise you tonight. We pray, God, that... Um, the great things that you have done in our lives would surface at this moment. Bring back to memory, God, your love in our lives. Bring back to thought, God, what you have done. Times that we've cried out to you, Lord, and you heard our prayer. And not just heard it, but you responded. 
Father, we want to use that as fuel to our worship tonight. Man, Lord, we pray that tonight every facet of what we have, music, God, to the word, to prayer, to communion, to, you know, pizza after and extend it. We pray all of that, Lord, would assist us in giving you glory, honor, and praise, God. And then each of those elements would allow us, God, to draw close to you. We want to seek you, God, because we know your word says if we seek you, we're going to find you. Right? If we knock, you're going to open that door. So, Lord, we, we come and we turn our hearts to you. And even now, Lord, before we even sing any songs, we pray that the meditation of our hearts and our minds, God, would be acceptable in your sight. So, receive our praise, receive our prayers, God. Receive tonight's word. We honor you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
my salvation where your love poured out over me oh now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to thee Sunset stream, oh, is free.
We love you so much. Lord, we are so excited to celebrate the new life that we have in you, Jesus. 
and we look back to Easter and the empty tomb, as Pastor Kaipo said, the empty cross too, we just praise you, Jesus, that we have new life in you, and the life that we have in you is unshakable. Lord, you cannot deny yourself, and you have said you will be faithful to us. So we thank you, Jesus, that your promises to us, that there's nothing that we could have that would be more secure than your promise to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you hold us, that you love us, that this new life will not be taken from us. Jesus, that we have freedom to live in this new life that you bought for us. And we just, we say, Jesus, as we have sung that our sins put you there, that what we did put you there. Jesus, that there was nothing about us that would bring you to us. Jesus, accept your love and your compassion toward our brokenness. Jesus, it was our sins that brought you to us, God. And we just thank you and praise you, God, that you are a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. A God who paid the price we couldn't pay. And we thank you now, Jesus, that we have absolute security in you. A living hope. God, not a dead hope, but a living hope, Jesus that we have substance to our faith, we have assurance of the things we're hoping for because you're alive. And Jesus, we give you all of the praise and all of the glory for what you have done in bringing dead people back to life. We thank you, Jesus. And now we pray, God, that as we hear your word, as we consider giving to your kingdom, Lord Jesus, would we uh, give out of the overflow of the life that you have bought for us? Jesus, this is, we, we can't earn anything from you. God, we, we can respond, though. Respond to the life that you have bought for us. Respond to the grace that you have given to us. And so we ask you, Jesus, to, to come and inhabit the praise of your people. Inhabit the gifts of your people. Inhabit the generosity of your people. And Jesus, would this, uh, would our offerings, would our, our praise to you, God, would they go to further your kingdom up country Maui? Lord, to our neighbors, to our families, to the global missions that we support. Jesus, we want to see your kingdom grow. And God, as we hear your word tonight, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would do a work that only you can do, which is to lead us to follow after you. So we pray, Jesus, that you'd come and be the good shepherd to us. Show us the way to walk. Show us the way to respond to this word that Kyle's going to bring to us. Holy Spirit, come and uh, speak through Kyle, Lord, and, and give to us um, the good seed of your word, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Amen. I'll say, my name is Kyle. Um, thank you, Pastor Kaipo, for that introduction. I am thankful to be a part of Waipuna Chapel's uh, church family, but also, like he said, uh, our family is one of the local missions that Waipuna supports. So thank you, uh, church, for being a part of that. We are a sports nonprofit that uses sports as a bridge to reach the next generation and share Jesus and disciple kids as they are walking uh, with Jesus in all of that. So uh, I will not use too much of this space to talk about that, but I would love to talk to you more about it if you're like, what, what does that mean? What is FCA? So um, today... I get the pleasure, Pastor Sean is out of town, so I get the pleasure of launching this new uh, series as we continue through the book of John, uh, Come and See. We're continuing through the Gospel of John, and John was an eyewitness to Jesus' story. It is a beautiful book to read and learn about who Jesus was from the words of someone who actually knew him, watched him, saw him. He experienced firsthand what Jesus did. But the story of Jesus is not just meant to be a history lesson. It's more than that, right? It's something we need to experience for ourselves. So even as we uh, read the words out of this eyewitness account, let ourselves put ourselves into the story and experience it with John. John's gospel, people were continually invited to come and see who Jesus was in hopes that Jesus would change their life. Nathaniel was one in John 1, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. In chapter 4, John tells us that Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. It's a well-known story, right? He lovingly speaks into her brokenness. 
And she is so moved by Jesus and his interaction with her that she runs back into her town and says to whoever will hear her in John 4, 29, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? You have to love the hope that her question and the invitation offers us. Can this be the Christ? Could this be the one who would heal me, who would save me? And maybe that's what some of you are hoping for even tonight. Someone who would heal you and save you and give you a new chance at life. Before moving to Maui, I was a youth pastor on the mainland for about 10 years. Um, Often within that, my favorite way of being a youth pastor in the community, uh, I was a local basketball coach at a high school. Um, I did that for a number of years, and I I always loved, you know, my youth kids and youth group, I'd see them once a week at best for a couple hours each week. My 15 high school basketball players, I would see them five or six times a week, two hours a day for six months, right? Right? And so there is deep relationship built up. By the end of every basketball season, I would invite them to come and see summer camp with us, the unashamed camp that Kaipo was just talking about for middle schoolers and high school kids. Youth groups all over the country do those summer camps, right? And it's an incredible opportunity for someone to come and see, come and taste and see that, that God's good. And so, you know, n- not every kid would say yes, but there's enough trust built up with some of them that a few did. And I remember one kid in particular. His name was Eric Cthulhu. He was a sophomore at the time, good kid. He was like a 4.25 GPA, starter on the basketball team, you know, like he's a stud. Um, He said yes. Long story short, we get to camp. I'm praying for him at every session. Like, man, if this kid would just taste and see, like he came, he's seen, like would he just like respond to the gospel? It gets to the night of the week where they're doing the gospel message, you know, and they're giving the kids all around, there's a thousand kids there, giving the kids all around the uh, gymnasium a chance to respond, and Eric doesn't respond. Like, man, if Eric, if you would just open your eyes to see, like you, I promise, like, you know, and in my heart, this is my heart's cry, of like, God, just help him to see you. He doesn't stand up. He doesn't respond. We go through, you know, post-session, small group. Nothing happens. You know, we're hanging out late night. It's, it's summer camp. And if you've ever been to summer camp with high school kids, you know, it's, we're staying up late, and it's a little crazy sometimes. And we're staying in a college dorm for this camp. And so uh, they're excited just by that fact, you know. And uh, by this point, like, we, we've forgotten about the night. We're just enjoying each other. We're just having fun. Around 11 o'clock, all the teenagers convinced my wife and I to drive them to In-N-Out. Do you guys know what In-N-Out Burger is? Okay, um, you know, and it's 11 o'clock at night, and you're midway through high school summer camp, so of course we said yes, and we piled into the church vans. There was 30 or 40 of us, teenagers and adults, and we drive to the local in and out to make them do a bunch of work before they close, and we get in there. We order all of our food. We come. We sit outside. It's Southern California, so it's warm enough there, too, in the summer, at least, to sit outside, and you know what Eric Cattulli does? He stands up on the tables outside of the in and out and he's like, I didn't respond earlier, but I'm responding right now. I want to put my faith in Jesus. And so in front of his 30 peers, we're cheering outside. We're screaming. Everybody's looking at us like, what's going on? And like Eric Cthulhu, my high school basketball player, stood up and said yes to Jesus for the first time. And it all started for him with come and see and decide for yourself hear the message, learn about who Jesus is. And there are Eric Cthulhu's in all of our lives, right? There is someone in your life, fill in the blank for you, a friend, a family member, a coworker, a former teammate of a sports team, whom all it might be is come and see, come and see. And Jesus continues to offer the same invitation he did to us at some point in our lives, those of us who are following Jesus, at some point, there was a come and see, come and hear the gospel, and we responded. And he continues, keep coming, keep seeing, come a little deeper this time, take one more step closer to me. So it's not just an initial come and see for the first time and respond like, Eric, yes, it is that. But also for all of us who have said yes to Jesus, it is keep coming and keep seeing. And we'll see that throughout the gospel of John in this series. And in John chapter 3, we meet a man named Nicodemus who came in secret by himself to see for himself who Jesus was. Let me pray and then we're going to read John 3 starting in verse 1. 
Lord, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for this moment in time where we get to talk about you and highlight who you are. Would you help us as we've come tonight to see you, to see the truth in your word, to see your love, to experience it, not just read about it like a history lesson, Lord, but as we listen, as I speak, would we all experience something tonight because you are with us. And this is truth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. Here we go. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Verse 4, Nicodemus' response. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answers, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. It's the third time he's declared, I'm telling you the truth, Nicodemus. Just, just a note. It's not in my notes anywhere else, but I thought I'd say it out loud. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Je just so you know, the Son of Man, that's a phrase Jesus would often use to talk about himself. So as he says, except the Son of Man, he's like, except me. He's, he's talking about himself. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man, Jesus, must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And I know you're excited for me to read the next verse but we're going to pause right there. So we have this Jewish religious leader. Let's call him a Bible professor for today's language. He knows the scriptures. He's a member of the ruling council of Pharisees. He's not young. He's not some up-and-coming Pharisee. He's the guy of guys within the Pharisees. A little bit of context. John chapter 1 John is, throughout the chapter, introducing key themes that he's going to unpack throughout the rest of his book. John chapter 3, what we're reading today, is part of the rest of the book. So real fast, uh, in John chapter 1, he really kind of introduces this whole born-again idea. Chapter 1, verse 11, he says, He came to that which was his own. Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name... Remember that. At the end, we'll come back to his name. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The idea of being born again is introduced before we ever get this popular, well-known moment with Nicodemus. And then remember chapter 2. So that's, you know, chapter 1, the idea is introduced. Chapter 2, right before this, this moment, this interaction with Nicodemus, Jesus is overturning the tables in the temple. He's throwing the money changers out. He's throwing all of these, you know, getting these people out of the temple courts. Who do you think that upset? The religious leaders, of which Nicodemus was one. And then chapter 3, Nicodemus is coming to Jesus. And so I don't know, and the authors don't tell us because this detail isn't necessarily important. I don't know if the religious leaders were all coming together and saying, no, Nicodemus, you go talk to Jesus of Nazareth and figure out why he's causing chaos. Or if they were all grumbling about him and Nicodemus thought to himself, I'm going to go talk. Maybe I can talk some sense into this guy because he's causing trouble. Whatever the motivation may be, 
we don't, we don't know. Again, the authors don't tell us because that detail isn't important to the point of the story. But what they do tell us is that Nicodemus was a religious leader. He, was, he knew scripture. He is not some guy who, who's not going to get it. And he came to Jesus at night. And then he begins to uh, lift Jesus up. He calls him rabbi. That would have been a very respectful term, right? And he says, we know you come from God. He's, he's, it's, I, I imagine with this, like I imagine it's the moment your kids walk up to you smiling. And they start complimenting you. Oh, you look good today, mom, dad. Like that breakfast was so good you made. And you're like, what do you want? You know, you're like, there's something, oh, there's something between the lines going on here. And I think that's what's happening with Nicodemus. I, I, I heard somebody once describe this interaction with Nicodemus as like, um, oh, I'm, I have it written down. What is, uh, oh, that's frustrating. Um, backroom politics. Like this is Nicodemus, a religious leader, coming to this new teacher on the scene who's causing trouble. And he's like, you know, this is what happens in Washington. This backroom politics moment, right? And I think that's kind of fitting for what Nicodemus is attempting. But what I love about being a follower of Jesus is that Jesus doesn't even give his approach any response. He completely ignores his comment, his compliments, and his attempt to scratch Jesus' back. And he goes right to the heart of Nicodemus' needs. He changes the subject. What Jesus says in response is verse 3, this wildly popular, well-known phrase, born again. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Later, he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Now, this phrase, born again, it's been around for a long time, right? It's been around since Jesus said it. That's kind of a long time. Uh, And over time, I think the meaning has shifted a little bit. And if you were to tell me today that, uh, you know, you have a friend who was born, who became born again, I would be, I would assume they weren't a Christian. They didn't believe in God. They maybe were living an immoral life. They found Jesus, were born again, and now they're following him. They're trying to. They're trying to live morally, right? There was this born again was this shift, non-Christian to Christian, immoral to moral, doesn't know God to knows God. But Jesus is talking to a Pharisee, a morally righteous, religion-filled Bible teacher. So even though we might use it to, today to describe someone that makes this shift from immoral to moral, doesn't know God to knows God. Like Jesus is talking to somebody who knows the Old Testament frontwards and backwards and sideways. He has large sections of the Hebrew Bible, if not the whole thing, memorized. This is a guy who gets it. And Jesus is telling him, you must be born again. So there's something different than just morality or knowing who God is. Something deeper that Jesus is trying to do with Nicodemus. The Greek word that's translated as again, the born again phrase, is onothen. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but that's how I pronounce it. Onothen. The word has two meanings. The literal meaning of the Greek word is from above. A second, culturally nuanced meaning is the word again, which is used here in John 3, verse 3. But in John 3, this word is used more than once, and in John 3, 31, it's actually translated as from above. So the same Greek word in the same chapter is translated as two different English words. So there's some nuance, right? And it's like, well, this isn't some deep, hidden biblical secret. This is just kind of how language works sometimes. In English, we have words, we have phrases that have like a literal meaning, but then we have like cultural nuanced meanings to those words. A few examples. Okay, the phrase nailed it. Uh, if, if I look around, like, okay, all these TVs are, are put up on uh, TV mounts, right? They're all mounted to the wall, right? These ones are screwed into the wall, but let's pretend for a second somebody nailed them in there. If I was to ask you, how did the TV mount get put up on the wall? You might say, well, somebody nailed it, right? Like the literal meaning of the phrase nailed it. But, you know, Josh, I'm glad you're here tonight because I had you written in as a shout out for this, right? But if I'm at the skate park and I'm like, bro, did you see Josh Marburger do the backflip last week? He nailed it, right? Like you get how like the same phrase, but two totally different things. Think of a word like legit. Like legit means true, like it is a true thing, but it also kind of just means cool now. And we could go on and on and on and on and on of words in English that have multiple, multiple meanings. And that's the same in Greek and a bunch of other languages. Like this is just a language thing, a cultural thing. There's a difference between being born again and being born from above, though. 
And so there's a sense of like, well, what did Jesus actually mean? Well, let's start with what Nicodemus thought he meant. Nicodemus responds to Jesus as if he's just told him to go and literally be born again in his mother's womb. Now, remember, Nicodemus is educated. Large sections of the Bible memorized. He's highly respected. His mind is sharp. I think his response leans much more to the sarcastic side than the, like, I don't really understand this side. He's like, trying to, like, Jesus, this is, that doesn't make sense. And so he's going to give him some sarcasm to go with it. I'll put before you tonight that I think Jesus wanted to place both meanings in front of Nicodemus. That he thought Nicodemus, hey, you're, you're sharp enough, Nicodemus. You can pick up on both of these things. It's not one or the other. It's not one, not the other. It's, let's, let's take both of them. And so I think for us, since our English Bibles only give us one word, I think it's helpful to kind of unpack both of them to fill in the nuance here. Being born again is about a new beginning. Being born again is about starting over. Telling Nicodemus he needed to start his life over. The way he had been living isn't working. The success and blessing he thinks he's experienced has not led and will not lead to what he really wants it to, connection with Yahweh. He needs a new beginning, a, a fresh start, focusing his gaze not on moral perfection through the law, but on something or maybe even someone else. Being born from above is about a new source. He's telling Nicodemus his life needs a new life source. If you have an orange tree and you want apples, there's no amount of watering or pruning or fertilizer or sunlight or effort that you put in will produce apples for your orange tree. The tree's still going to give you oranges. The tree needs to be uprooted and you need to plant an apple tree. The fruit needs a different source. He needs to start back at the beginning, at the basics, but to start from a new source. And this plays true in my life. I've been walking with Jesus since I was young. I've also been walking in sin since I was young. And I can't just start over every time I sin. I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, often, if I am trying to get out of sin and I just start back where I began, I'm going to end up in the same place. And to kill this cycle of sin, I need a new source. I need to be uprooted and given a new heart. I need to change tracks so that when I go again, I'm going in a different direction to a different outcome, a different experience. And that's exactly what the Old Testament's described as the human need. And Nicodemus, of all people, knew this. In Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, 24 to 28, it's up on the screen. It says, For I will take you out of the nations. This is God talking through Ezekiel, his prophet, who's a mouthpiece for God. So all the eyes in these short four verses, this is God saying, I, 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 okay? If you can, on your own, count them. Put a tally mark on your notes or something. How many times does God say he's going to do something in these four short verses? For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. And this moment in Ezekiel 36 is not the only time in the Old Testament where this need of like, you can't do it with the heart you have. You need something new. It's not even the only time in Ezekiel that God prophesies through his prophet saying the humans need a new heart. They don't just need a do-over. They got that in the flood. Humanity got a do-over in the flood. Humans needed a new heart, a new source of life, and God knew it. He knew that the law would show the Israelites what sin was, and the law was meant to allow them to see their need for a Savior, their inability to follow the law on their own, they needed a new source, a source that could allow them. And God is like, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. Because you can't do it on your own, right? We know this is true because we know we can't do it on our own. This is what they were looking forward to in the Messiah. He would restore God's people back to God, a new David, a new Moses, but better than David and better than Moses. Nicodemus and the religious ruling council of Pharisees lived to follow the law. And that in following the law, they would somehow turn the orange tree inside their heart into an apple tree. 
I can only imagine the depth of desire inside of Jesus as he looks at his child, Nicodemus, who I believe wanted connection with Yahweh, but he looked for the connection through the law. Jesus just wants Nicodemus to look at him. Which is why he brings up Moses and the serpent in the wilderness in this same interaction, right? He says, I don't know, if you may not know the story, so we're going to read it. It is nine verses long, so stick with me with it, okay? And it is Old Testament, so it might get a little funky for a moment. Um, but from Numbers 21, which is first five books of the Bible, the law, right? If Nicodemus is going to know anything from the Old Testament, it's going to be the first five books of the Bible. So when he references this, Jesus knows Nicodemus has all the context already ready to go in his mind. We might not, so we're going to read it. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming along the road to Atharim, he attacked the Israelites and captured some of them. Then Israel made this vow to the Lord, if you will deliver these people into our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's plea and gave the Canaanites over to them. They completely destroyed them and their town, so the place was named Hormah. Verse 4, they traveled from Mount Hor along the, the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now, something I just, I, I, I see as I read this real fast uh, the people came, and they asked for the snakes to be taken away. Did God take the snakes away? No. But he did give them a way out, right? That's interesting. Just let us sit there for you. Let's see what the Spirit does. Jesus here, with Nicodemus, he references this random nine verses from the book of Numbers. After that, what we just finished reading, it just like the story continues as if this whole snake thing didn't happen. It, just like keeps going, all right? Like uh, G Nicodemus would fully understand the context. He's a teacher of the law. The Israelites are being attacked by snakes. Snakes sent by God, it says. Pastor Kaipo can explain that part to you later. What I want us to focus on from that story is what God tells Moses to do in order to save the Israelites from the scary snakes that God sent. God tells Moses to make a snake and to put it on a pole. This Hebrew word pole, think banner, signal, like it's not just a simple wooden stick, but something that people are going to see, okay? Any Israelite bitten by the snake sent from God can do what to it? They look, they see, to look upon the snake, look up to the signal, look up to the snake on the pole. Was there special power in the pole? Was there special power in the snake that Moses made? No? No? That it was an act of faith, right? These Israelites who had forgotten it was God who delivered their enemies into their hands now acted on faith in the word of that same God. That doing what he said to do would bring the healing that they needed. The snake, the pole, Moses didn't heal, heal them. Yahweh healed them because of their faith. Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses is lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man Remember, Jesus, he's talking about himself. So also the must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? That all who believes in him may have eternal life. All who look upon the Son of Man and place their faith in him, who is lifted up on his own pole, will have eternal life, he says. Eternal life. Nicodemus, this is what's at stake for you. You teacher of the law, morally righteous on the outside, but lacking faith, which leads to eternal life. This is what's at stake for us. God doesn't want a bunch of Bible nerd do-gooders, right? Humans ran that play before, and they're called Pharisees. We talk poorly about them nowadays, right? Jesus tells Nicodemus, and right now, would you put yourself in his shoes this evening? 
and hear Jesus speaking to you. You must be born on a thin, both again and from above. You need a new start and a new source. A new start and a new source. Let the Lord do a new thing in your heart. Let him give you a new heart and start you on a new path. So as we start this Come and See series through the Gospel of John, I want the foundation of this series, the first weekend of this series, to scream, come and see Jesus. Come and look. Come and lift your eyes to the signal, the banner, the cross, where Jesus died for you. See him. Really see Jesus. Let everything else that you do come from seeing him. Let your actions and your good works flow out of a gaze set upon Christ, not actions and good works that are meant to receive his good favor, but simply your gaze is set there and you can't help but do good works because you're looking at a good savior. This is what's placed before us this morning. If you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, regardless of what your life looks like on the outside, because remember, Jesus speaks right to the heart. As you've come this evening to see, is God good? Is he real? Does he love you? Does he even care about you? Maybe you've come, but it wasn't because you wanted to see. You weren't looking for anything. You didn't want to see. Somebody made you come, forced you, incentivized you, whatever it may be. Would you open your eyes anyway? Open your eyes and see Jesus. Fix your gaze toward Jesus. Place your faith in him and have the eternal life that he says starts right now. And the New Testament authors who follow after the Gospel of John, they understood this teaching from Jesus. In 1 Peter 1.3, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Colossians 3.10, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Ephesians 4, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to be put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Galatians 6, neither neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Romans 6, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Acts 5, go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Last one, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Amen? Amen. It's not about going back to the beginning and starting over. Jesus was bringing a new thing, ushering in a new era, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. He offered his life on the cross that you might have a new life from a new life source. He took the place that I deserved. He paid the price of my debt and he carried the weight of my sins. My role in his redemption plan is to put my faith in him, to fix my gaze upon Jesus, to trust in his ways and his plan. In my head, there was going to be a chair on stage, so I'm going to steal a chair real fast if it comes apart easily. It's all right, I've done that before. Okay, my favorite illustration, talking about faith, involves chairs. If I sit on the chair, or if if I stand on the chair, I have faith. I didn't even have to think about it, because I've stood on these kinds of chairs many times in my life. But I have faith, it's going to hold me up. When I stand on it, it's not going to just buckle and break. If it did, that would be embarrassing and sad, and I'd probably get hurt. But I don't think it's going to break. I have faith that this chair is going to hold me up. But who is actually, or what is actually doing the work of holding me up? Am I doing the work, or is the chair doing the work, right? So my faith is in the chair to hold me up. But I don't do the work. The chair does. And it's similar with Jesus. My faith is in him to hold me up, to save me. But he does the work, right? He did the work on the cross. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus in his message to be born again, stop trying to hold yourself up. Stop trusting in your works and your morals to save you. Put your faith truly in Yahweh. Trust fully in the Son of Man, in Jesus. The Son of Man was lifted up on a cross like Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness. Anyone who looked upon the snake was healed. Anyone who looks upon Jesus and believes in him will have eternal life. 
He did the work on the cross. We simply stand with our faith. We stand in his works, not our own, and we let God birth a new thing through us. Come and see Jesus lifted up for you. Now, we'll finish here, okay? Why? Maybe you're saying, okay, this all sounds really cool, Kyle. You're like talking about the Bible and it kind of makes sense, but like, why should I sit in the chair and put my faith in Jesus? Why should I keep coming and seeing? Why should I do it again? Why should I take a step further? And I think Nicodemus might have had those same questions because it's not the end of Jesus' interaction with him, right? It keeps going. We stopped at verse 15. Let's pick up John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, last one we'll read. I promise we're almost done. You guys have been awesome. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name, in the name of God's one and only son. Why believe in this God? Because he is a God who loves you and who sent his son not to condemn you, but to save you. He is not for your condemnation. He's not standing up there waiting to throw lightning bolts down because you are not morally perfect. The Pharisees viewed God this way. So they had to trust in the law and their good works and their righteousness, but it's not enough. The Bible tells us our righteousness is like filthy rags. He loves us so much. And what kind of God is he? What does that love look like? It looks like sending his son to die, to save us, not to condemn us, to be with us. We're going to transition from here to partaking in communion together, remembering what his son did as he came and died on the cross, remembering his body and his blood that was shed for us. And I'm going to read first what Paul teaches to the Corinthian church about communion And then I'm going to leave you kind of with this like respond moment, challenge moment. We'll pray. We'll do some more worship. Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Partaking in communion together as a body of Christ, as a body of believers, is a physical act in response to Jesus' work on the cross. Internally, I have inner faith that he is who he says he is. Communion is this outward response because I physically stand up out of my chair, come grab it, physically put something in my mouth, my body's doing something, I'm drinking something, like I'm physically remembering Jesus on the cross. It is a physical response to the inner faith that I have in Jesus. Does that make sense? You kind of tracking with that? Yeah? So as we do that tonight, as we remember that his death paid my price, our price, your price, would this evening, would we let it be a moment of choosing, no matter what you came in like tonight, no matter what you're carrying with you, whether you felt far from God or near to him, He invites you to come and see once more, to come a little deeper. Maybe you came in tonight and you have some hurts and some pains and some things that you're going through. Would would this be a physical moment of remembering the hurt and the pain that he went through to be with you in your pain? Maybe you came in here tonight and and you, you have not put your faith in Jesus. You're sitting in your chair out there and you're standing at this chair, the faith chair, and you don't want to sit down yet. You're like, I'm not ready yet, Jesus, to put my faith out. I'll stand here. I'll look at it. I'm not sure if I like the color of the chair. I don't know if the cushion will feel good. I'm not sure if I should sit and trust your works yet, Jesus. And if that's you, if you feel that way in any way, my challenge, my, my, my hope for you is that this moment of taking communion could be a line in the sand for you where you say, okay, Jesus, I will surrender. And here, I innerly, inwardly surrender faith. Outwardly, I'm going to step forward. I'm going to get in line. I'm going to take communion with this body of believers that trusts in you. You don't have to have all the answers to have faith. 
You don't have to expect everything to be perfect. Your, your life doesn't have to be figured out to have faith. Jesus says, just lift your eyes, put your gaze on me. All of us can come and see Jesus and go deeper into relationship with him. We all have a next step of faith. And so lastly, before I pray, if the Holy Spirit prompts anything in you tonight, if he prompts you to step forward and respond and say yes to Jesus for the first time, if he prompts you like, you, you just feel this tug of like, God's calling me into something deeper. And I don't want to fill in the blanks for what that might be for you because it's different for all of us. We're all in different places. But if there's something the Spirit's doing in you tonight, don't leave without sharing it with someone. Maybe it's with the prayer team that comes up here at the end. Maybe it's with your spouse that you're here with, a friend that you're here with, your neighbor that you're sitting next to. Even if you don't know them, just say it to them out loud and hopefully they won't think that you're weird. But just, it could be me afterward, Pastor Kaipo, anybody. Say, before you get in your car and you drive home, share with somebody, hey, the Spirit's prompting something in me. I don't even know what it is, but I know the Spirit's working something. Would you be praying with me? Hey, tonight I stepped over a line and I sat down in this chair and I said yes to Jesus. Would you join me? I don't know what to do, right? So whatever that might be like for you, I just want to challenge you. If you feel the Spirit stir in something, don't go home without sharing it with somebody verbally. Don't text them, tell them, okay? Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the truth from John chapter three, this this moment, this interaction we get between Nicodemus and, and you, Jesus, Thank you for preserving this story for us, that we can read it, that we can glean truth from it. Lord, would you help us day in and day out to be born on thin, to be born again, to be born from above. Help us to be confident in our birth. Help us to be confident that you gave us a new heart. You removed the heart of stone and you gave us a heart of flesh, just like Ezekiel talked about. Help us to be confident that we've looked, we've, we've raised our eyes, we've put our gaze upon you, Jesus, and we're healed, we're saved. But would we continue to do it every single day? Look up, we wake up, look up to see you, Jesus. So as we come to church, as we come, we, as we go out to work, to our families, to the lives that we live Monday through Saturday, would you help us to see you, Jesus? and to let everything else in our life flow from our sight of you, from our salvation in you, from your work on the cross, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together. Jesus, um, yeah, we give you praise, Lord. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time that we've had together. What a great invitation, Lord, it is for us. What great grace, God. What great mercy for us to be able to hear what is offered to us. To come and see, Lord. To come and taste. To come and know that you are good that you are loving and caring and kind and the thoughts that you have for us are good thoughts. Jesus, I, I pray, Lord, for each person in here that they would, um, whether tonight was their first step or, or many of steps, right, to come, Lord, to your table. I pray, God, that tonight and, and this weekend, Lord, and throughout this next week, Lord, and I, I pray that we would continue to take steps, God, to you that we would continue to slow down a little bit and fix our attention on you. I love what Hebrews 12 says, that, that if we fix our eyes on you, you become the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord. And, and so I pray that would happen, God, right? That as we, as we lean on you a little bit, you would show yourself to be 
dependable and trustworthy and a sustainer, a provider. I'm not sure, Lord, what the needs are in, in, in this place. Nicodemus had some needs, Lord, and he wasn't talking of, but you knew, Lord. You knew what he needed, and you know, you know what we need, Lord. And so what a great offer uh, it is for us tonight, Lord, to, to come and see you, to come and know you, God, to, man, to, to see you, to... Yeah, we honor you, Lord, tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Kyle uh, and, his, and his diligence, Lord, to your word. Lord, we receive your spoken word tonight. We pray that the result would be more glory and honor and praise to you, God, and then more, more uh, faith in our lives. Jesus, we honor you. In your name we pray.